So I'm here to, to take a few minutes of your time and I do appreciate all of you taking the time to attend this session. We had great sessions about architecture before me. I'm going to focus specifically on the cloud architecture. And as we were talking earlier, this is a growing field and you, know, you may be an expert in other areas and hopefully this talk will motivate to take your existing skills and you might have great architecture design skills in other domains. Hopefully this talk will motivate you to take those existing skills and map them to some of the cloud architecture skills that I'm going to talk about, okay? So uh, with that, let's get started. Uh, you know, this is, uh, nobody needs to be told this. I used to have this slide, a version of this slide a few years back when I used to say, cloud is the future backbone of IT. And I've removed the word future. Cloud is the backbone of IT. And this is the transformational change that has happened in the cloud. And in order to take advantage of this, and we are talking about a trillion with a T, trillion dollar industry that is that is moving towards the cloud and imagine the kinds of opportunities and skill sets that are going to be needed. So with that said, my agenda is really broken up into five parts. And uh, I'm going to touch on these areas. Of course, you know, we could have a talk on any one of these topics, but hopefully I can give you a 360 degree view. When I talked to Mahesh first, he gave me some ideas about what uh, the audience would like to hear. I took his feedback, incorporated that into the agenda here as well. So we'll talk about these five things. We'll start out with what are cloud architect responsibilities. And before we jump into patterns and technology, I want to talk about responsibilities. Uh, then we will touch a little bit about cloud design patterns. And I saw that there was a great discussion about CQRS before. I will take a look at the pattern, but from a cloud perspective. Then we will look at some of the Lego blocks that you need to, as an architect, you need to have an intuition for how these building blocks come together. And then, of course, uh, thinking about the cost. The cost is becoming an important factor in the cloud. And uh, we will talk about that, give you some ways to think about that. And of course, no talk about cloud architecture is complete without automations. We'll spend some time on automation as well. Okay, but that gets started. Let's go with item number one, which is what are the cloud architect responsibilities? And before you get into the technology of it, you know, Azure and AWS and Google and whatnot, before we go into that, uh, let's take a step back, right? In order to be successful in the cloud, there are a few things that need to come together. And, and if you're an aspiring cloud architect, I encourage you to pay attention to these things as well, as much as learning these technical skills. So Peter Drucker, I'm sure you've heard of this famous quote from Peter Drucker, that a, a culture eats strategy for breakfast. What did he mean by that? You might have the best cloud strategy, but if you don't have the culture, you're not going to be successful in the cloud. So how can you as an architect bring about a cultural change in your organization? Right. One thing you can do, and by the way, no architects succeed by just sending out an email and issuing a decree. Nobody listens to them in that manner. You have to figure out a way to collaborate with people, create a culture. So cloud is all about agility. Cloud is all about automation. Cloud is all about shared responsibility. Cloud is not about us versus them. This is a production issue. Well, did you put enough observability in your code that we could debug that at 2 a.m. in the night. So that's a developer responsibility as well. So to the extent you can talk about culture, that will improve the outcomes. Collaboration is important. We find that cloud projects are successful if you have an executive backing into that cloud project. You need to collaborate with whoever is the exec executive sponsor. You need to collaborate with your networking folks. You need to collaborate with your security folks, okay? Then think about the adoption framework, and I'll give you an example of this. By adoption framework, I mean by now, there is a wealth of information available out there about how organizations should adopt cloud. So all the way from a strategy to a plan phase to a migrate phase, there's enough documentation out there. So as you develop your cloud skills, technical skills, Think about the adoption framework as well, and I'll give you an example. And of course, we will talk about architecture. So this slide you know, shows some of the skills that I have in mind. 
And of course, see the skills on the left-hand side, application architecture. We're going to talk about that automation, high availability, governance. No cloud architect is going to have these skills, of course. The important thing to note here is that you reach out to the right people in the organization, develop some understanding. So you might have somebody in your organization which who is responsible for networking and networking on premises. Maybe they are used to very used to some sort of a micro segmentation model. And in the cloud, of course, it is all software defined networking. So work with them, use their expertise. Similarly, ITSM, there may be people with ITIL experience in your organization or in your client's organization. How do you build a bridge with them to see how will that self-provisioning that is working today will work in the cloud? So technical skills, collaborating, and then non-technical skills in my mind are equally, if not more important, change management. Cloud is about a change. How do you make change management happen? Read about that. Communication, collaboration, and I can't stress enough on the self-starting part. Cloud is changing constantly. And if you don't have the self-starting man mindset, you cannot become an expert in the cloud. So cloud adoption framework, right? This is a framework which is out there uh, in the Microsoft site, about 500 or so pages of information. Talk about strategy, plan. Once you've planned, you've done an app uh, portfolio modernization. Now you're ready to set up a landing zone. What should be the naming convention? How should you structure it? What is the organization of your business? What business units do you have? What kind of naming convention will that entail? Migrate, innovate, and of course, governance phases, and then managing observability, maturity of operations, and so on and so forth, right? So read about these things as well. All right, so that concludes the first section of my talk. Think about culture, think about collaboration, think about the non-technical skills, broaden your understanding about the framework and adoption framework. And oh, by the way, you know, even if you're working in Azure, there's great wealth of information in other platforms as well that you can learn from. So don't limit yourself to just one set of guidance. Okay, so I'm going to shift gears, move into cloud design patterns. So uh, there was great discussions. The prior speaker talked about CQRS and very good patterns. I want to focus on one type of patterns, which hopefully will allow me to communicate a couple of important points in my talk, resilience patterns. And this is really important from my perspective because you, know, you want your applications to be highly resilient. So the first pattern that comes to mind and is probably the retry logic. And you're probably thinking to yourself, Vishwas, I've seen retry logic. I use it all the time. Well, what has this got to do with the cloud? Well, retry logic becomes more important in the cloud. Why so? Because in an on-premises world, you have a dedicated piece of hardware, oftentimes over-provisioned. So you don't see any of the throttling that might happen. In the cloud, you're dependent on multiple services running in a multi-tenant environment which means you may get throttled, which means you might have a transient fault, which will go away momentarily, but you need to be smart enough to handle that transient failure. So the retry logic becomes really important. In fact, let me do this. I'm going to go to Visual Studio Code really quickly and show you a couple of examples to motivate that right here. Okay, so let's... Uh, let me find right here... Um, I should have had that file here, but um, I did not. So let me just, just find it here. Yeah, there's the retry logic. And I, I just want to call out a couple of things here and let me get think, this thing out of the mix. So by now, any cloud service that you're using, and I'm going to use an Azure specific example because that's where I spend most of the time, but these patterns apply to any cloud. So if you're using any Azure service today, the client SDK for that service gives you some sort of a retry policy. And if you don't have an SDK that gives you a retry policy, then you can, of course, take advantage of open source projects like Poly, which is an excellent resource for you to use. But let's take a look at the Cosmos DB example, line four. I'm setting up a connection policy. I'm setting up the maximum retry attempts, which means if the first attempt fails because of some throttling reason, please try this call again three times but then limit the retry to 60 seconds. Makes sense, quite simple to understand. Let's take a look at the, the storage example. Here, the options are a little bit more advanced. So once again, I'm creating a blob client. 
And here I'm setting up a retry policy, which is exponential retry. What does that mean? I'm going to try once. If I get a transient failure, I'm going to back off. And every time I back off, I'm going to increase the time exponentially. And that's a best practice, because imagine if you're writing a multi-threaded application and each one of them try every five seconds, then you're going to have the same throttling problem. So it's better to sort of you know, spread the retry attempts across. Now look at the line 16 here. Not only are we retrying, we also have this ability to say primary, then secondary. So if my three primary attempts fail, then hey, hey, storage, retry me or send me to secondary. And I might get a read-only experience, but at least I have a connection to a storage location. So that's the retry logic. OK, so let's go back here. One interesting thing I've learned from my journey in the cloud is that retrial logic is not only important, you need to be able to test this logic. So when I showed you this code here, go back to this code, when I showed you this line 14 to line 16, this is a pretty important piece of code. The problem with this code is that it never gets executed because it is really hard for me to recreate a transient fault as a result, this important piece of code, 14, 15, 16, 17, is going to be executed at 2 AM, the worst possible time, and then you will not know why it executed in this manner and what happened. Okay, So it's really important to test your retry logic. So how should you test your retry logic if you don't have a way to simulate a transient failure? Well, I'll show you an example here. Right here, what I have is a virtual machine running. What I did here was I got the open source code for Redis. Uh, and you know in my application, I was architecting using Azure Redis cache service, but I wanted to test my retrial logic. So what I did was download the C++ version of Redis server, injected some chaos into that. And now I ran a client against that for a thousand operations and seeing, oh, so my retry logic executed a thousand times or whatever the chaos number was, and how many operations out of that failed. And that gives me a way to reason about my retry logic. Okay. And, and here's the client code. I think I, I should be able to show you the client client code in a second. Let's go here. And if I can easily find it. Um, so Redis client, and if I go in here, right here is my client code. And you can see I'm making a thousand operations here. And then I, this piece of code, this is testing my retry logic. Okay, makes sense? So find creative ways about how you can test your retry logic. Now, in certain cases, you will find that it is not a transient fault, and it is actually a more permanent problem and now you have to worry about resource exhaustion. What do I mean by that? So you're going to keep retrying, and there is not a transient fault. As a result, you're going to keep calling a downstream system. You're going to fill up the queue. At some point, you'll get into resource exhaustion, and you will cause an outage. And I'll show you an example in a moment. There's a website which talks about root cause analysis of all cloud outages. And if you look through the root cause analysis of the past outages, you'll find that a majority of them are related to resource exhaustion. And very simple pattern, and if you put this pattern in place, a very simple pattern to solve this problem is break the circuit pattern. Let's just walk through some code and, and you know to, to see how retrap pattern can be implemented. Okay, so circuit breaker pattern. Sorry, I, I said uh, retrap pattern, I meant circuit breaker. So let's look at this code. How is the circuit breaker implemented here? So I'm going to make a call to the downstream system. I check if the circuit is open, which means I cannot make a call to the downstream system. Then I'll execute this piece of code. We will look at that in a second. But if the circuit is closed, I simply let that call go through. Makes sense? Now let's look at what happens if the circuit is open. If the circuit is open, the first thing I do here is I check if I have spent enough time waiting, see, I don't want to inundate my downstream system, so I wait for a certain period of time. I check if I've waited for that time. After I've waited for that amount of time, I take a lock. Why do I take a lock? This is a multi-threaded application. I don't want to overwhelm my downstream system, so I take a lock, so only one thread goes through. One thread is going through here. I do a half open. I make a call to the downstream system. If the downstream system succeeds, I'm ready to close my circuit. 
Okay, so very easy to understand. I, you know, ten lines of code, but this can save you so many uh, outages that can result from uh, resource exhaustion. Okay, so we have talked about this. Let's talk about one of the resilience pattern, and then we will move on. So. Uninitialized state is a very common bug or a problem, and we have seen this all over. I want to motivate a very interesting example of this uninitialized state that can only happen in the cloud. Okay, so let me bring up a code example to show you. By the way, I have gone through all of these problems myself, so you can think of this slide as learn from Vishwas's mistakes. That would not be a far-fetched statement. So I've gone through all of these problems. And uh, let me walk you through this example right here. Okay, I'm going to close some of these to make myself more room. So I want to show you this example. In this case, what is happening is I'm bringing up a compute instance. The compute instance comes in. It is, uh, and then I do some initialization as part of my compute instance. And I wrote this code. And since the initialization is expensive, I went in with a best practice. What is that best practice? The best practice is right here, I go into this file here, the best practice is line 11, that if my compute instance gets recycled, please do not clean up my local storage. That's an optimization that most people will use. So when my instance was coming back up, and because I had that optimization, I needed to check if the initialization had been done so how do I check that? I wrote a breadcrumb. I wrote a breadcrumb on the D drive. So if the machine came up, I checked the breadcrumb. I did not initialize. I saved myself that initialization time. Make sense? Now, what happened to me in this instance is that compute had a disk failure. So Azure automatically moved to me to a new machine, kept my D drive the same, gave me a brand new C drive. As a result, my registry was not initialized with all the things that I needed, okay? So my breadcrumbs logic was faulty. Of course, you can fix this quite easily, but these kinds of attack vectors are possible in, in the cloud where you, unbeknownst to you, you might end up getting a new C drive, okay? And you have to deal with that kind of initialization problem. So keep those things in mind. The last pattern I want to talk about planning for resilience. And let me talk about, uh, this for a second. Uh, actually, uh, just to talk about this previous slide. So there's this slide called Common Causes of Cloud Outages. And I will make this slide deck available right after this session. Uh, you can I can put a link on my Twitter feed, or I'll send it to the organizers, and they'll have this so you can look at these. So this is a site called the Common Causes of Cloud Outages. I simply did a search for resource exhaustion. And notice here on the right how many finds it has of resource exhaustion. So remember I was talking about the circuit breaker pattern that causes resource exhaustion. Majority of the cloud outages are because of resource exhaustion. Okay, let's talk about resilience modeling and analysis. Sounds like a fancy term, does it not? So this is a technique that Microsoft Teams use internally to improve the resilience of their service. There's a link down there, you can download that. But the idea is quite simple, much like you, at the early stage of the design of your project, you think about security these days. If you don't, you should be. That's what DevSecOps is all about. What this technique is talking about is much like you think about security during the early stages of your application, you should also think about reliability for your application. How do you do that? So let me show you an example right here. So simply take a component interaction diagram right here. So take a component interaction diagram and right here, what we do is we figure out all of the failure modes of this diagram. So, so this compute instance is calling the storage account. So this is one failure mode. I'm calling uh, a queue storage. That's another failure mode. I'm calling a database. That's another failure mode. And notice the signs here, which says throttling right here. This is throttling, which means I can be delayed. I, can, I might have a shared access signature to my storage account, which might have expired. These are all failure scenarios. I might be dependent on an external service right here. So imagine that if you can draw this component interaction diagram, you take every failure mode, 2A, 3B, 2C, all of the ones listed here, take these failure modes, you make sure that you have a way to detect these failures, and then you make sure that you have a way to mitigate that. That's what 
resilience modeling and analysis is all about. Important thing to note here is you will never get into a state where you have mitigated every single potential failure because frankly, that's a business decision. Every time you try to mitigate a failure mode, it's an expense to the overall cost of the project. And you need to figure out what is that business justification for what resilience needs that you may bring as part of your design. Okay, so uh, let's keep moving here. So that concludes my second part of my talk, which is the design patterns. And as I said earlier, I have only given you resilience patterns. I encourage you to look at the architecture pattern site, look at all of the patterns that apply here, anti-corruption pattern, asynchronous request reply. So go keep going to this architecture center, pick a pattern whenever you have time, look at one pattern, think about it, and then in this manner, continue to widen your horizons in terms of usage of these patterns, all right? So that concludes the second section of my talk. We talked about the culture and adoption first. We talked about patterns. Now let's look at the Azure building blocks, which are sort of the Lego blocks of Azure. And as an architect, you need to have an intuition for what these building blocks are. And I know that there are lots of building blocks. There are over 200 services in Azure. No one person can know all of that. And of course, you have to rely on your teams, your dev leads, your developers, your others, you have to rely on them. But as an architect, you need to try to develop an intuition for uh, what these building blocks are and how you can put them together in your architecture. So I want to take example of only one compute option. I can draw the similar diagram for networking, for messaging, for storage, but let's just talk about compute here. So as you know, in Azure, we have many different compute options. You have VMs, we have VM scale sets, of course. You have uh, Azure container instances. If you've not used them, container as a service, you just create a container, don't worry about the host. You have Azure app service, which can be run with or without containers. You have Azure, uh, Kubernetes service, which is the managed Kubernetes service. You have serverless computing with Azure functions. And then of course you have Azure batch, which gives you sort of batch-like capability. Now, what do I mean by develop an intuition for which one to use when? So here's an example. I have a monolithic application and I want to run it in Azure. I can run it on a VM, of course. I can run it on a container instance, but maybe the preferred option is Azure app service because uh, all of the manageability is being done by the Azure platform, reducing your total cost of ownership. If I have an end-tier application, I may want to run it in Azure App Service as well. If I'm trying to build a microservices-based application where I have dozens of microservices, then I may want to take advantage of AKS. And I'm only showing Linux containers here. This slide needs to be updated. As of 28 April, Windows containers GA with AKS as well. So you could use Windows containers or Linux containers. If you're building an event-driven application, functions is a great option. Now, let's explore that further. So people often talk about, I get an event, I am acting on it in a stateless manner, and functions are great. What if are, you are acting in a stateful manner? Well, uh, there is this notion of durable functions that you should be looking at, a very interesting capability there. So think about the options that are available to you. Similarly, if you're trying to write a batch operation, of course you can run this batch operation inside Kubernetes, but you can also run it if the batch operation is sort of short-lived, maybe you can run it as a function. But if the batch operation is truly a long running operation, then Azure Batch may be the best option for you to consider. Okay. So this is what I mean by know the building blocks, have an intuition about what are the strengths of these building blocks. Let's look at Azure SQL database for uh, just to motivate this example of what I mean by these building blocks. Azure SQL database, we all know and love the database service. It gives us Geo replication. It gives us automatic asynchronous replication. That's what the Geo replication feature is all about. It gives us multiple secondaries. Now, if you have to fail over, you either it's an unplanned failover or a planned failover, you need to initiate that action. And then you need to uh, think about the failback options. What do I mean by failback? So primary fails back, for, primary fails into secondary, and now primary comes back up, you are able to fail back into the primary. That's what I mean by failback. Now you need to understand these characteristics 
And then you have to also understand that when you initiate a failover operation, your connection string has to change because now you're going and talking to one of the secondaries. How will you deal with that? What DevOps do you have in place to be able to support that connection string change? Let's look at Cosmos DB. Cosmos DB, of course, natively supports geo replication. It supports automatic regional failures. Of course, it has multi-master support now. If you've not looked at that, you have two locations. They can write, and then you can do deconflicting, understanding those kinds of things. And the last thing I will say about Cosmos DB here is that in this case, if the primary fails, Cosmos DB will automatically redirect you to secondary one, secondary two, depending on the order you've specified, without you having to change the connection string. Knowing those kinds of details are important when you're designing for resilience of your application. The last example I will give you about the intuition of these building blocks is PaaS meets VNAT. So I find that lots of application architects have a good understanding of, hey, I know app service. I know containers, but do you know where app services interact with something like VNet? So to, to, to motivate this example, so as you know, if you've created an Azure SQL database or a storage, these are multi-tenant services, or you've created an app service instance, there are multi-tenant services which are available, the endpoint is available on the internet, right? That's what multi-tenant shared service is all about. Now, if you're going and working with a healthcare company and they require the data to not ever go over the internet, how do you deal with that? Well, what you do is you create an app service instance called the app service environment, which is an isolated app service instance inside your virtual network, right? That's how you create it. So you really had to choose between the two. You had to give up some capabilities to get the other one. Well, Microsoft has introduced new capability called private link and if you look at what private link enables you to do, you can still use your multi-tenant services, but you can also ensure that the connection is happening over a private network, okay? So that's what private link is all about. So this is what I mean by keeping track of what are the new capabilities and how they impact your design decisions. Okay, so that concludes my section three. Remember we had five sections to talk about. We started with culture patterns, and the building blocks was the third one. Okay, so let's look at the cost. And this is probably the one which I'm most passionate about. I have many customers who are spending a very large amount in the cloud every month. And I think of it as my personal mission to make sure that they're using the cloud resources in a manner that is most optimal to them. And to show you an example, uh, let's look at this case study here. So imagine that I'm an organization and I have these four kinds of workloads, okay? These four kinds of workloads. So the first kind of workload is I have web servers that can see an unpredictable spike. I have certain services that will see some predictable spike, nine to five high, after five low, so I have a predictable spike. I have some bad jobs, some data processing jobs that I run at night. And then I have some line of business applications that uh, I have to run 24 by seven because they don't get too much use, uh, but I still have to have them because even if a small number of users are using it, they need access to that application 24 by seven. Today I'm running this entire portfolio of applications, maybe in an on-premises setup, or I do a lift and shift of that into an Azure data center, and I can run them on 100 VMs, four core each. So I can run this 100 machines and can, I can run all of this infrastructure right here, okay? How much will this cost me? This will cost me about $658,000 a year. That's expensive. How can we reduce the cost? Let's look at some of the options. For uh, unpredictable uh, burst in requirements. I can take advantage of something called the burstable VMs. I'll explain in a moment what these are. For predictable spikes, I'm going to use VM scale sets. For bad jobs, which I don't care about finishing in 15 minutes, I can take a few hours to finish. I'm going to take advantage of low priority or spot instances. For my line of business applications, which requ don't require a high number of active users, I might containerize it. So how will these options save me some money? Let's take a look. What are burstable VMs? And if you don't know this, this is a really an interesting concept. And the best way to explain this concept is 
I'm sure in some point you have had a cell phone plan which gave you rollover minutes. And think of that for a moment, and that's what this is all about. You buy a VM at a certain baseline performance. For the time that you are not using the baseline performance and you are using less than the baseline, Microsoft will see that you are using less than the baseline. They will give you credits for that, and then you can use those credits to then uh, pay for the spikes when they come up. Make sense? So that's a burstable VM. If I did that, I can save 50% of my web server cost, which is 10% of my overall cost. Okay, that's one way of looking at it. VM scale set. So VM scale set is a very interesting capability where you can spin up multiple VMs in a really speedy manner. And Microsoft actually under the covers is doing some interesting magic. Let's say you ask for 10 VMs. They guarantee you that you will get 10 VMs in a very short period of time. And under the covers, they actually provision 13 or 14 VMs because you know one or two VMs, if they fail, you're still able to give you 10 and you pay for 10. Okay, that's what VM scale set is all about. So you can scale up and down very, very quickly. If you take advantage of that, you save another 25% on the services cost, which is 11% savings over your annual spend. Let's keep going. Low priority VMs now called the spot VMs. And I love this because you know I don't know if you've, if you've run that command, my favorite way of uh, provisioning VMs is AZ, uh, command line interface. And I love this because I can say AZ CLI, give me a spot instance, and only give me this VM because I'm willing to pay you this much money. And if there is enough access capacity available, they will say, yes, we can give you this, or don't give me a machine at that time. Right? That's the idea behind a spot instance. But here is where your architectural cells come into play. What does spot instance mean? Spot instance means that you're going to get up to 80% of discount. But of course, there's a catch. There's always a catch, right? And the catch is that they are going to yank that machine from you with a 30-second notice. Well, no problem if you have architected it well. If you have implemented some sort of a checkpoint restart pattern where you started a bad job, and every 10 minutes you put a checkpoint, and ten, seven minutes into that, Microsoft yanks that machine. You go back to your previous checkpoint, get another VM, start running that. Now you have saved your organization about 80% of the cost. Okay. The last thing I'm going to talk about, and let's see the, so the cost, 60 to 80% of the cost. The last thing I'm going to talk about is the line of business applications. What we find often with customers is they're paying for the entire VM, but they're only using CPU at a 10 or 11%, okay? which is which is, well, you're paying for the entire VM, only you're using 11% does not make sense. How about we containerize your application? And if we containerize your application, we can save you another 65%. How so? You take a line of business application, containerize it as a Windows container or a Linux container, and then get, and then sort of tightly pack that virtual machine. And what the beauty of containers is that you can put resource gates around that. What do I mean by that? So I can take a line of business application, containerize it as a Windows container app, run it uh, on top of AKS, for example, and I can put a resource quota and say, this line of business application will only use this many milli cores and these many milli bytes of memory, and it cannot go outside the bound of that. So that way, I can pack on that VM or that node of AKS 20 applications if I have to. So now I'm greatly reducing the cost of running my line of business applications. So think about these things about cost saving, and this is very much an architectural consideration. It's not just a financial consideration here. Okay, so we've concluded the four sections of my talk here. The fourth one was cost. Let me go to the final portion of my talk, which is about uh, automation. Okay, so uh, automation, of course, is important, and there have been enough talks about uh, CI/CD and DevOps and continuous integration and continuous deployment. And there have been tons and tons of talk, and many of the audiences who's, who's here today, you are very familiar with those concepts. In fact, many of you are doing CI/CD in an on-premises world, right? This has been around for some time. So what do I mean by automation? I mean by automation, think of infrastructure as code. Think of tools like Azure CLI, ARM templates. If you are in a multi-cloud setting, think of things like uh, 
Terraform, which is a multi-cloud. If you are a JavaScript developer and if you're new to infrastructure as code, think of tools like Spulumi, which is a JavaScript syntax for provisioning infrastructure. So, so know about those tools, figure out what is the skill set of your organization and try to use this tool. Of course, learn about DevOps platforms. Azure DevOps, of course, uh, GitHub Actions is gaining some real traction. Things like the DevSecOps. I'm sure you've seen this, right? If you have a public GitHub repo, you get an email saying, hey, this is a public GitHub repo. You are using a library which has a known vulnerability and would you like to fix it, right? All of those DevSecOps options and automations are going to be really important. But I want you to think beyond that. I want you to think beyond infrastructure as code. I want you to think beyond CI, CD. And I want to think about automation as a way to make your cloud journey successful. So I wrote a blog post about two or three years back. Let me just, uh, the blog post is listed at the bottom of the screen here. And I took the picture from the blog post and I have it here. And let me explain this. And then we'll take a couple of examples uh, and see how that relate to this here. So when people move to the cloud, right, there are three or four different constituencies who are looking at the cloud. Of course, you have the CIO, Mr. CIO or, or Mrs. CIO. Uh, they have certain uh, uh, digital transformation objectives about the cloud. They want capabilities as service. They want to evacuate their data centers. They want to remove the capacity constraints. They want to lower their time to value. So when they are looking at the cloud, they're looking at for these reasons. Of course, you have the ops people who are saying, I used to be able to do that in my on-premises data center. How do I do that in the cloud? I had great ITSM tools. I had great networking tools in the cloud, which told me exactly uh, how my network was doing. And I want the same expectation in the cloud. I had great resilience and compliance and security compliance story. I had a single glass of management and I expect all these things in the cloud, okay? And then of course you have the app community. They're expecting CI, CD, hybrid architectures. They want their languages and tools. They want their performance. They want self-service provisioning. So as you can see, three groups, they all have expectations from the cloud. And, and what we find today is you might run into a situation where there may be a gap between these expectations. And let me call out a couple of examples here that will bring home this point. The first example I want to bring out is Azure API Management, one of my favorite services. Azure API Management has a GitHub support built in. So you go to Azure API Management and go into the portal and enable GitHub integration. And what will happen is as you write Azure Management, Azure API Management policies, those will be synchronized with GitHub. And you can manage your versioning of your policies in that manner. Okay a great capability. But I was working with an organization where multiple organizations or multiple divisions in that company were writing these policies and they did not want to store all of the policies in one place. They all had a separate approval process. And at that time, Azure API management was not supporting this model. And that became a showstopper for them. Well. We wrote just a little bit of automation pixie dust. We just sprinkled a little bit of pixie dust of automation, created a workflow where developers from different divisions could check in their policies, go through the approval process, and then integrate with the common repository. Okay? That's an example of an automation that met the gap. Now, what happened? Uh, in 2020, Azure API management team has gone in with this model of ARM template-based deployments, which allows you some of the flexibility that we were looking at two years back. So think of these pieces of automation as scaffolding pieces of code. They may go away when the product teams implement that capability, but when these products don't have that capability and they become a critical bottleneck between these expectations, you can write a just bit about of code to make that happen. Let me give you one final example related to this working with a customer uh, that was in a controlled environment. They were they had to have their applications as PCI compliant, uh, payment card, card industry compliance. One of the tenets of payment card industry compliance is something called the data exfiltration. What does that mean? 
if I'm writing applications, uh, I'm writing data to a storage location, I should only be allowed to write to a known whitelist of storage accounts. Okay, that's what data exfiltration means. And at that time, there was no private link capability which allows data exfiltration. So we wrote a little bit of automation to make sure that the calls are routed to a certain set of storage accounts only. So think of automation in this manner. And I want to leave you with this one important uh, thought. I was attending a cloud conference and there was a panel discussion going on. I was, I was listening to the panel discussion. The people on the stage were CIOs and CTOs of five companies who have been using the cloud for the last five years. Okay. And the, the host or the moderator of that panel discussion asked them one final question. You all of you have been in the cloud for five years. If you had to take one thing from your experience and share with the audience, what would that be? And you know, and that perked up my ears and I was thinking, hey, this is really a really important nugget of information. I should pay attention to that. Each one of those uh, guests on that panel discussion said, Automation was key to our success. We invested a lot in automation, but if we had to redo this project again, redo the last five years, we would invest even more in automation. So take what you want from this little incident, but it told me a lot about how these successful companies are thinking about automation. Okay, so that, that concludes our five sections. Uh, before I end, I just had a quick, call to action. So how do you become a cloud architect? Of course, think about the things that I talked about. But how do you continuously learn? Get engaged with cloud projects. There may be another group within the company that may be doing some cloud project. Get involved, volunteer your time. Engage with the community. Every uh, city that you are in has a great community. I know C-Sharp Corner has a great community in many, many parts of the world. Get engaged. I cannot stress enough about self-learning. The cadence of the cloud is too high for you to wait for a training class or a conference. You have to learn these things on your own. Then broaden your horizons. Even if you're an app developer, understand what is meant by software-defined networking. So I'll give you one challenge. Think about this for a moment. Remember, I was talking about the private link, right? And let me bring up that slide. I'll give you this challenge. I want you to think about it uh, when you have when you go for a walk next time. So let me bring up this slide here. And this is a challenge for you to think about. So I said that the private link ensures that the packets coming out of your service into storage, into SQL, will only travel over your network. Think about how that's implemented. And, uh, and the answer is, some form of software-defined networking. Of course, that's the obvious answer. But how does that entail? What's happening? What are the packets? Who's stamping the packet? How is that happening? Think about it. This may not be your primary area of expertise, but thinking about these things will go a long way in, in helping you uh, broaden your understanding. Then improve your automation scripts. As an architect, you have to be handy in one automation tool of your choice will make your analysis much better. So focus on that. And then I cannot stress on this enough. Improve your collaboration skills, improve your communication skills. Success in the cloud is only going to come by you collaborating with a collection of people. So sometimes it's the non-technical skills that are going to be more important than your technical skills. And I will end my talk with this last drawing that my daughter drew. Uh, and this is so true for cloud architecture. What this message is really about is your success in the cloud. So it will be not just be dependent on your aptitude. Okay, It will not just about your aptitude. I mean, there are many, many smart people out there. But this is not about your aptitude. It is about your attitude that will determine your cloud altitude. Okay, ultimately that's what this is all about. Okay, so thank you for giving me a few minutes to share my experiences. Uh, I'm going to come out of the presentation mode so I can see the screen back. Mahesh, Magnus, over to you guys.